Welcome back to Humber News. Feel the rhythm, feel the vibes. As part of Black History Month in February, the Caribbean community took the moves of Soka and put them on ice. Humber reporter Tatiana Patterson went down to Harbor Front Center to see these two worlds meet. TD presented the Kumba Festival held at Harbor Front Center. Soka on Ice featured Dr. Jay DeSoka Prince, who brought Caribbean vibes to the ice. Mother of two, Alicia Thompson, speaks about her experience. The music's good, the DJ's good, the kids are having a great time, it's good weather, it's, it's fun. I haven't been skating since I was 12, so it's something different to do on a Saturday night, right? Anti-winter lovers came out of their homes to jump up and wave in celebration of Black History Month. The event was free and attracted people of all ages and races. Shanice Carter was loving the atmosphere. Just the music and everybody dancing, it's just a different experience, I love it. If they have it again next year, I'm coming back. Participants jumped on their skates and waved their hands while Derek Bandu talks about last year's festival. Dr. J spinning the music up top. Lots of people around, family, friends, everybody's doing it tonight. You know what I'm saying? So they had this last year. I was here. It was splendid. It was glamorous. It was the bomb. You know what I mean? I had a grand old time. I even won a prize. You know what I mean? If you've never been, make sure you put this on your calendar for next year's third annual Soka on Ice. Soka on Ice is not the only event featured at the Kumba Festival. There have been art exhibits, storytelling, as well as fashion and dance, all exploring the African roots. Tatiana Patterson, Humber News. For those subscribing to the Zodiac Calendar, Lunar Fest was the place to be this year. Thousands gathered at the Harbor Front Center to usher in the Year of the Dragon and take part in the annual Lunar Fest celebrations. The free event, sponsored by CIBC, treated guests to numerous activities celebrating Chinese culture. Attractions included children's workshops, arts and crafts, as well as many different games and prizes with a Chinese twist. Those on hand also had the opportunity to take in the world's first lantern aquarium, the Treasures of the Sea exhibit, celebrating the sea, dragon, and other creatures of the deep, treated guests to a stunning display of light and color by some of Taiwan's best lantern artists. Well, this next story will tug at your heart. Courage Canada is a charity that makes hockey accessible for blind and visually impaired across the country. Our reporter Jonathan Zettel went to a local arena to meet some of Toronto's most courageous kids. That's Andy. He's just like every other boy who loves to play hockey, except that Andy is visually impaired. Ask him how happy he is to be on the ice today. I'll school to Toronto State Infinity. In, in. Andy and 20 other blind and visually impaired students from the Toronto District School Board laced up their skates and hit the ice. And all of this is thanks to Courage Canada. Courage Canada was founded by Mark Demontis, who dreamed he would play professional hockey, but lost his vision at the age of 17. I, I decided I wanted to, uh, instead of giving up, make a difference for kids across Canada who are blind and visually impaired, give them the chance to play hockey. And that's why I founded Courage Canada. Courage Canada has teamed up with the Canadian National Institute for the Blind and Accessible Media to put as many visually impaired kids from all across the country on the ice. CNIB President John Rafferty is excited to see this many kids out on the ice and hopes for more in the future. It's great. 20, 20 kids was the limit today and it's great to see them all out here. Hopefully next year we'll have 40 kids. But for now, these kids are thrilled to be here. These kids are learning how to shoot, pass, stick handle, and even body check. And all of this is thanks to Courage Canada. Jonathan Zettel, Humber News. Yoga and Pilates are popular forms of exercise on their own, but one Humber class has combined the two. Students met throughout the semester to unwind and stay healthy. The downward dog and the warrior don't sound like exercises, but they're common poses and yoga lattes. Humber's yoga lattes class meets every week. The group works together to improve flexibility and maintain good health. Community members and students past and present bring water bottles, comfortable clothes and mats to benefit from the meeting. All of the moves are just really fun and challenging and it makes me sweat, so it's good. Soothing music plays in the background while the instructor calmly guides members through the meditative experience. Maureen martin Day has worked at Humber for 20 years and is responsible for the introduction of yoga lattes to the school. We didn't have a yoga program at Humber College and I thought this is a great way to initiate it to the staff and students. So I started teaching yoga. <laughs> Although the moves look easy, the 20 to 30 weekly participants feel the strain, but not on their wallets. All athletic class fees are covered by tuition costs. I feel just 
one with everything, you know, and it's easier to take on a lot of things in life and, you know, it's, uh, I suggest it to anyone. The group meets every Thursday at noon in Humber's Athletic Center. Though many participants are regulars, the group welcomes newcomers. That's our news. Now to Tim Milne, who has sports highlights from throughout the year. Good day, everyone. The Major League Soccer season is underway, and Toronto FC spent months training in the GTA. Humber reporter Tyler Hunt went down to the training facility in Oakville to see how preparations were shaping up. The MLS preseason is underway. Toronto FC visited the Oakland Soccer Club as the team continues their preparations for the upcoming MLS campaign. Last off-season's arrival of head coach Aaron Vinter and assistant coach Bob DeClerc brought many changes to the club. However, this is the first full preseason that's been organized under the influence of the Dutch duo. Goalkeeper Milos Kocic says it's proven to be a much more stable preseason for the players. Yeah, obviously we have uh, some players that are coming back and uh, much more than last year. And I think uh, having a core group is very important. That you know, it's going to keep the rest of the group organized. And uh, you know, getting into the preseason with uh, a lot of players that you already familiar faces is very important for the team. With the new coaching staff in charge, Toronto have adopted a style of play which is unique to North American soccer. For the team, obviously, it's a completely different system. Um, we want to play out of the back, we want to be comfortable with the ball, make sure everybody wants the ball and is not trying to hide on the field. Um, it, it, it's an adjustment, you know. Um, I think this league is more physically where you just kind of um, move the ball and run after it and, and hope for things, but uh, I think we're actively trying to to create our goals, create our chances. We want to beat LA, first of all, and then progress to the next stage. So let's see what happens and uh, take one step at a time. Obviously, playoff is, uh, is a must this year. We, we missed uh, since the, the club found it. So I think it's very important for us to stay, stay, stay on the ground and take one game at a time and you know approach every game as the, as the most important. For Humber News, I'm Tyler Hunt. While they may not play professionally, these floor hockey players don't let that stop them from getting competitive. Humber reporter Jacob Gallo went to the gym to watch a game. The Humber Intramural Floor Hockey League kicked off its winter season with a new revamped set of rules, brand new equipment, and a new student fee. Went from uh, these sticks here, that were, you know, they're just a little bit flimsier, they're smaller sticks, it's not a little bit, you know, for the taller players, a little bit more difficult. We uh, then went to these things which they're stiffer, they're longer, they've been a lot more well accepted. Rules have been changed heavily to accommodate all players and to create parity throughout the league. Went from having a rule where you have to have one girl on at all times to taking that out because we're finding, you know, a lot of teams were bringing just one girl that wasn't being consistent with the teams, you know. So they scratched that rule, took that out so that the teams could be more consistent. There is a $30 deposit fee that students pay before the season to ensure player safety and attendance to all the games. While the league is an overall friendly environment, games can get heated and become very competitive, which helps liven the atmosphere. With 16 teams competing, there are more teams than ever involved in the league, large in part due to the new rule changes. The newer, more expensive sticks give the more skilled players a chance to showcase their abilities on a low stress stage. With games every day, there is a chance for students to come out and watch the games. Humber News, Jacob Gallo. Fans of Humber basketball were treated to many excitement packed games throughout the semester. I had the chance myself to go down and check one of them out. From the opening tip Sunday night's matchup between the two top teams in the OCAA's Western Conference. The Humber Hawks and Algoma Thunderbirds battled tooth and nail until with 3.6 seconds left on the clock, this happened. <laughs> Second year guard Mark Perrin led the way for the Hawks, scoring 21 points, including his game winner. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sleep good tonight. I'm going to sleep real good tonight. Perrin's final shot came off a pass from Akeem Sween, who surpassed the 600-point mark in the fourth quarter. Head coach Sean Collins talked about the final play call after the game. It's an inbounds play that's a staple with us, and we can pick and choose who gets the ball. 
Um, I just felt based on how they were playing, it would put the ball in his hands and get some cutters. It would give us a few options. Um, and I thought, you know, they, the way they called the game, it was fine. There was a lot, a lot of clutching and grabbing, but it was going both ways. So I thought if we were aggressive, we would get something positive out of it. And we got a wide open look, and Mark was able to get it off before the buzzer. The wins the Gears the Hawks top place in the Western Conference. The first ever Dodge Moneyball Tournament took place earlier this semester, bringing to a close the Toronto Sports Social Club dodgeball season. Our own Kelly Snyder was there. Amateur dodgeball players converged at Odsington Avenue's St. Luke Catholic Elementary School to compete for the top prize and bragging rights in the Dodge Moneyball Tournament, hosted by a local Toronto Mature Sports Club. We offer it to um, a lot of our members on our website, but it's open to anyone really. So a lot of people who play dodgeball in the other leagues and our leagues, they all kind of come together and play in tournaments. So they're quite frequently at the tournaments and stuff. The winning team was presented with a check for $500, but having a good time was the real goal for many of the players. It truly was for the love of the game. I think it's a great way to get exercise and get out any aggression that you have by uh, whipping balls at people. It's great fun. Uh, we came out uh, to basically play with some people that we didn't play with before. It's always good to like meet people. After a long day, Bad Essence and Dalla Dalla Bilio went head to head in the championship final. After a score of 7-2, Bad Essence came out on top, winning not only the title, but the check as well. Uh, it feels good, you know, we went out there, we gave 110% and uh, we worked hard. So, uh, you know, it feels good and we're just glad that all, uh, all our hard work and practice paid off. Although the tournament's coming to an end, teams and participants are eagerly awaiting and getting ready for next year's tournament to win the big prize. From St. Luke's on Ossington, I'm Kelly Snyder, Humber News. That's it from the world of sports. Now with your entertainment news, we go to the lovely Jen Alvarez. Thanks, Tim. The Oscars may be over, but those of us north of the border still have reason to celebrate another successful film season. Alex Fuller has more on the Genie Awards. This may not be Hollywood, but Canada has its own brand of cinematic brilliance to celebrate. Hosts Andrea Martin and George Strombolopoulos kicked off the 32nd Annual Genie Awards with an opening address at this special media sneak preview at the Western Harbour Castle Conference Centre. The TV business in Canada is very separate from the film business in this country and I think for, for stars to cross over and for stories to reach Canadian, both sides need to work with each other and I think this is going to be another example of this happening, just bringing film and TV in this country together which I think will be a lot of fun. Following the speech, Toronto's media were given a first look at the awards fair, like the specially made Genie Martini, made with Grey Goose vodka, white wine and lemon juice. Uh, all of the stars come out to our events and, and that's something that's really great because the best actors in the world and the biggest celebrities drink Grey Goose and so again, a lot of the, the public looks to, uh, to Grey Goose itself for a lot of the trends. Reporters also had a chance to talk one-on-one -on -one with the awards hosts. This is really about facilitating the celebration of some pretty fantastic artists, right? Now we want to be entertaining and fun and joke around and we, you know, we, we like each other so we want to enjoy the moment as well. But it's not so much about what we yeah. are going to do it's for It's not it. our show. Yeah, right? it's just about celebrating the art. Yeah. The 32nd Annual Genie Awards are set to go on Thursday night at 8 p.m. on CBC Television. Until then, I'm Alex Fuller, Humber News. The prize not may, may not have been a million dollars like the hit show that inspired it, but many of the school's brightest performers came out to prove that Humber's got talent. Tim Blake was there to take in the excitement. Hundreds came out to support some of Humber's most talented performers at the annual Humber's Got Talent competition. Acts from both North and Lakeshore campus were each given five minutes to perform in front of the audience and three judges, one of which was Link's manager, Chris. Really good. I see a brand new faces, so it should be something good. A lot of music, a lot of dance, I think is going to happen. A variety of performances ranging from dance to jazz to rap represented Humber's multicultural population and entertained spectators from all walks of life. For percussionist group Adrian and the Drummers, it was as much about putting on a good show as it was about winning. <laughs> if we win, like, of course, one doesn't want to win. If we don't win, I still enjoy having fun with the crowd. The energetic performance impressed all in attendance and won Adrian's group a spot in the finals. 
In the end, it was narrowed down to three groups, but only one could go home the winner. After receiving the loudest audience applause, Adrian and the drummers won over the crowd and took home the grand prize. For winning Humber's Got Talent, Adrian and the drummers will take home a trip for four to Panama City in Florida. Truly a golden prize. This has been Tim Blake for Humber News. It's that time of year again. Every summer, Hollywood blockbusters rake in millions of dollars. In light of Toronto's booming film industry, the city is looking to make the most of it. Toronto's Economic Committee sat down with industry insiders to discuss how the city can cash in. CEO of one of Canada's leading production equipment companies and chair of Toronto's biggest studio, Paul Bronfman, brought his expertise to City Hall via Skype. He said Toronto is becoming a go-to option for major productions. Good old Canada, good old Toronto. We're boring, we're predictable, we're reliable, and we've got depth and breadth of crew and infrastructure. According to a report tabled by Film Commissioner Peter Finestone, Toronto's film and television industry revenue increased by 25% over the last year. The report highlighted the importance of the McGuinty tax credit and recommended Mayor Rob Ford send McGuinty a letter to thank him for boosting the city's film industry. Feinstone says there are a number of ways the booming industry benefits uh, the Toronto. The city's profile, um, attractiveness to uh, business investors or um, the kinds of foreign workers that we're trying to attract to uh, make sure that our other sectors you know, maintain that, that uh, cutting edge and so on, that having a film industry like this um, actually is very attractive and is helping us in, in those areas. Those who work in the film industry are happy about the number of jobs finding their way to the city's media landscape. Humber College film student Aaron Bray and, gave his uh, take on how this will it's affect It's already got him. a large uh, built-up film industry, and it's still growing. It's always growing. They're always bringing more and more big productions in. Um, and I think that helps out over a lot of cities. because yeah, Toronto is the California. third largest production city in North America, just behind New York and Los Angeles. That's all of your entertainment news. Now back to the desk. Thanks, Jen. That concludes this year's edition of Humber Highlights. I'm Kelly Snyder. And I'm Alex Fuller. Thanks for watching.